What's up, guys? Mike Penta here with the Mind Gym Podcast, and today I could probably have them arguably one of the most interesting guys alive. He can rip a phone book in half with his hands, he can knock a tree down just by staring at it, and he can take a close-ended question and give you a 30-minute answer. I don't know how he does it, but he manages to do it. Audio jungle. Guest today is Kent Ward um, with Heavy Hitters. He's a boxing coach in New London. He works with youth kids. He's got a son who's a professional uh, fighter. He's been working with athletes for a very long time. Today we're going to kind of talk about you know a little bit of mental toughness, working with young kids uh, who really you know like I said, this is an inner city type of environment uh, that we're in, where we where we're from, and Heavy Hitters and his program that targets and works with those kids and, and underprivileged kids. So how working with kids without a, I guess, a strong male figure in their life, would you say? Um, some of them do, some of them don't, but, you know, come from rough backgrounds, how to help develop those kids to be, you know, mentally tough. And most of them become boxers. Um, he's been work, worked with kids that are uh, guys that are champions. Uh, he works with athletes, like I said. So just, again, definitely for me, I met Ken a few years ago and Definitely the most interesting man I ever met, and it's awesome because he's still grinding. Uh, he works hard. He works out hard. He's in amazing shape, um, and he it's awesome to see. So, Kent? Thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so let's start start off about – I talked about a little bit. You work with young young kids, and the program is called Heavy Hitters. Yeah. Heavy. Um, now, what's Heavy Hitters aim to do? Like, when did that – what was the inception of Heavy Hitters? What was the – why did you decide to do – you know, kind of get into that? Heavy Hitters I, – I actually started the program, um, not formally, but the Heavy Hitters thing uh, years and years ago down in Florida. Yep. Um, and I was helping some guys coach down there. I was playing a little ball myself at the time and helping some guys coach some youth sports. And, and I – I didn't have a lot of experience coaching youth sports, but they, these were young kids, and I noticed that a lot of the coaches were win, very win-win-win-minded. Yep. And kids weren't getting in. And I, I said, geez, there's nine, ten-year-olds over here. What, they should be on the field. Well, it's kind of slow, and you know, we, this is a big game. A big game. It's, a, it's, just, it's a, just a youth game. I mean, it's not, we're not... You know, this kid's probably not going to go on. He may not go on to do anything anyway. We don't know. But the yeah. idea is he should be playing. So I started a little program down there. And, and some of the heavier kids, that's the, why the name ended up coming from them. Oh, some, wow. of, some of the heavier kids, that you know, they they wouldn't put them in the, in, as goalie in the net because they weren't quick enough or they weren't quick enough runners or whatever the case was. So, so I got I to do a little program for these heavier kids. So I had a friend of mine that had a had an, uh, an old hangar at Red Aircraft in Fort Lauderdale. Part of it, it wasn't using. So I went in there, I put some heavy bags up, I put some things up, and I gathered some of these kids up, talked to the parents, and I said, look, I got a little program. I'm going to work with some of the kids. If you're interested in it, I said, we'll keep the kids going. We'll, we'll teach them some good hand-eye coordination, some movement drills, some quickness drills. That way they can keep developing. And if they decide to stay as an athlete or go back into the athletic arena they'll have some skill sets to be able to participate especially if they're going to play for a coach that doesn't want does, to play. doesn't want to play yeah so and i said i gotta name this something i don't want to call it you know heavy kids so we, i said well heavy hitters and i call it heavy hitters because heavy hitters could be anything heavy yeah. hitters is the, the head of a big company you know real you know real important person is called a heavy hitter yeah you know big mob boss heavy hitter yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> so, it, so so the so the name worked out you know, so and and uh, and then when I came up this way, I I brought the, I continued the program up here, and we formalized it a little more. Uh, a friend of mine, Nancy Rogers, um, helped me put all the paperwork together, form the nonprofit. Yep. And that's what we've been doing. We've been it's 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 youth boxing, intercollegiate youth wrestling. Um, we, we've done some dance things over the years. We've explored a lot of different programs over the years. I'm I'm, I would say the the the, the dubious title of founder and president of the corporation and i have been the part-time yeah and i and i always say well temporary not part-time but temporary uh 
uh, director, executive director of the program, always looking for the, yeah. the real executive director to come along someday that I could turn this over to, you know. But that's not happening. And not, not you know, I have somebody in mind, and um, but but down the line, because it's not a paid position. There's yeah. not, it's, yeah, it's, not, it's not, it's what it is right it's now. It's a nonprofit organization. It, yeah. And, and you want to keep it a nonprofit. Well, you can, yeah. Well, I mean, nonprofit on the sense of you're, yeah. you started the beverage company, which tries to bring in money to be right. able to send out to, to bring to, kids in. Yeah. So yeah, that you can yeah. have an organization where you have yeah. coaches and pay those. And then nonprofit in the sense, like, you don't want a corporation that's going to sit there and just make astronomical amounts of money. You don't care about that. You want to make no. sure that you can pay people that's to come right. in and work yeah. with kids. And keep the programs going. Keep the programs yeah. going that's that it. don't have anything. Yep. Um, that's all. And you, when you came, when did you come back to New London from Florida? I was in and out for years. I, but uh, I came back to stay. Um, so when did you, the program probably, start? Probably 30 years ago. You brought, this, oh, wow. I, I brought this program back up from another gym that I had. We, what we did in that gym was called... Um, it was called CGAG, which was Southeastern Connecticut Gang Activities Group. It was oh, wow. a program started by a police officer named Nick Naholnik. And he got all these kids together that were on the verge of, of gang membership yep. or some who had been in gangs, and we were trying to pluck them from them. Um, we got them together every Saturday morning. Police officers from various towns showed up, uh, brought their kids from their towns in. Again, Nick was ahead of his time with that program. It was he, he, he struggled for funding. Yeah. And at the time, the DOJ, Department of Justice, um, they weren't looking as heavy heavily into prevention Rehabbing. as they were incarceration. I got gotcha. you. Right? So now they're looking more also in prevention things now. But Nick, if Nick had been, been a little later, it might have done better. But we struggled with that program. But we kept it going. Yeah. Kept, we, we, we did move a lot of kids along. Um, I, I, I can't mention the names of some of the kids, but there's some kids right here in this community that have done, just came through it and have done well. Yeah. And um, But that would be up to them to say what they do. But um, And so the hand then the heavy hitters thing continued right along with that. And then when the gym opened up in London 15, 16 years ago, heavy hitters went right along with it. So it's, it's been around a while. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know yeah. how long. I actually, this is the first time I ever heard about yeah. how the whole program started. Yeah. We talked to each other every day. I never yeah. think I really asked too much. I just saw what you were doing. Right. And that was good enough for me. Um, but what do you see with these young kids coming into these programs now? Um, you Do they just walk through your door? Or do you go out and get them? Or? No, they just come in. They, you know, we're, we're, where we are positioned in New London, especially down on Bank Street. Yeah, you know, we, I mean the kids are all around. They'll walk through the door with the basketball under their arm, and Just they see the rings and all the guys in there. And I want a box, you know. So yeah. Now do you do you would you say like most of them come through the program and they stay, or are they in and out, or what do you do? I mean, it, they've got to be so disorganized as young kids. Oh yeah, yeah. Those uh -huh. are the Abra. We call them. That's our special group. We call them the Abracadabra kids. Yeah. Right, they magically needs. appear, yeah. they disappear, and they magically reappear. And the interesting part about these kids is they walk through the door after being out for six months and just walk up and think, hey, coach, how you doing? <laughs> like they were there yesterday. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. But it was my wife who has uh, been involved with these, you know, she's been a phys ed teacher at New London High for 35 years. She's the one who said that I was a little strict in the beginning. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you're in or you're out, and yeah. this is what you have to do. And she said, "Don't do that. Don't. No. You. What you need to do is, is establish parameters for these kids. And when they come through the door, and they're not going to be comfortable in the beginning. They're going to come through with a chip on their shoulder and their little panache and their little street savvy. And they're going to find out that it's not going to work in your gym. Yeah. And then they're going to have to find their way to be in your gym. And then they're going to leave. And you, what you need to try to do is make the time out of that gym shorter and shorter so that they become more comfortable in that gym and want to stay in there and then talk to you about their things, that why they're leaving yeah. or what else is going on, uh, which was great advice, great advice. It came from all her experience and everything. So, But that's where it is. That's that group, and, you know, they're in and out. Some kids stay. Some kids are career-minded. Some kids, we have kids in there that have, have a great amateur career going. Uh, one kid's going to strive for the Olympics. Um, there's a couple of kids that are on the verge of turning pro. There are pros in there. Yeah. And that's what so, I wanted to transition yeah. to now so, yeah. is now your work. You also, I mean, this is just one part of the program uh, at Wayland City Boxing, but now you also have 
your guys that you train to fight, guys and girls. Right. Um, so when did that start? When did you start to say, okay, I want to actually start working with professional or try to work with kids to be professional athletes? Because anyone that knows Kent in this area, I mean, that's what you're known for is working with fighters. Right. Um, you know, they don't really know much about you. Anytime I, you know, mention your name other than people who, you know, are a little older know about you. But, I mean, the you know, anytime you talk to somebody in this area, you, oh, the boxing coach, the guy that owns a boxing gym and works with these fighters and, and your son's a uh, professional fighter. And, you know, so what's it like working with these guys, these these kids? I mean, you said they're amateurs, they're teenagers working up to being pros like what do you what do you see in them what what makes them so much better than just a kid who comes in your gym well they they it's i guess various reasons for those guys some of them um you know i i think they weren't sure what they were going to do they have this 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 optimism about that like right around the corner great things are going to happen to me yeah and they make it through high school and the high school door hits them in the butt and it's like, oh boy. Yeah. And, but still, they think I'm going to be okay here. So they work in some different jobs and they're not working out and on these jobs. And so pretty soon they start seeing that the guy, some of the guys are the turn pro and yeah. they're getting paid to fight. And, they're, and so they start developing that mindset that, you know, I could do this, you know. And many of them find out they can't. Yeah. It's just whether it's, it's, it's limitations on their skills or the fact that it's just, it's too demanding. Or they just don't want it after they get into it. But it's a small group, small group that'll that'll that can turn professional and be successful with it. Yeah. Um, now those guys, what do you think separates them from? I mean, most of them aren't undefeated. What 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 do you think? Once you get knocked down or knocked out or lose a fight, like what? How do these guys get back into it? Like mentally, I mean, that's a pretty blow to their like a huge blow to their confidence yeah. uh, what do you do as a coach to work with them to get them to say listen i mean that's that's just reality this is the way it is um like what do you what do you do with these guys i mean you must see them go from a major high getting ready to fight losing a fight to a major low and that you gotta that's your responsibility not just yeah. to train them but to yeah. bring them back up like what what do you see and how do you work with these kids like how do you get them to get their confidence back is what i'm saying well you see look that that whole you can witness that in the locker room the night of somebody's fight. Yeah. What goes through these fighters' minds in that locker room the night of the fight. The the highs and lows, the mood swings, the questioning themselves. Did I train enough? Then I'm ready. Then I'm not ready. And why am I doing this? And one guy sitting around with his earphones on just sitting there and the other guy pacing. And, and the coaches are, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the kid turns around and the coach is like, like that and the kid turns around and the coaches yeah yeah you know and it's it's unbelievable the 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 dynamics in that locker room and that's all the way leading up from the time the kid signs two months out from a fight yeah. that you sign a contract for a fight for a certain weight and in your mind is i have to cut 15 17 18 20 23 25 28 pounds whatever weight class that they're fighting in and, and, and ultimately though you know, i mean with that how do you think they get through that though i mean because they all do it i mean most of them do most professionals most, do it they do it yeah so yeah. what 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 is it that makes them they they have a light switch you work with these kids that can just say you know what this is the shit i just have to do yeah it's well it's, it's or is it your job to it, it, push it, them it's the job it's you know you 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 try to get these the, the fighters and 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 uh, these young people along to where you start out pushing, yeah, and and some of them move along easily. Some of them are are reluctant, and you have to step off and push, and you step to the side and you push. And then, what you want to develop is you want them to bring you along with them. You want them to take that over. You, so you try to try to get them to develop their attitude, their mindset, their confidence level, their skill set. So that it no longer requires pushing, pushing hard, yeah. to so that they're moving forward on their own with their own steps, and coach is coming along. Coach is coming with me, and then you're guiding at that point. Now you're polishing and keeping things ready and making sure as a little mood swing one way or this is happening over here, making sure that the skill set's right, the conditioning is where it's got to be because we would call them like the doors of doubt. Yeah. Everybody has them. 
That's like every, that's every, life today. Everybody's mind, fighter or no fighter. Yeah. You have doors of doubt, and you you know, and and it's up, and it's like a core door, up in your. And I try to have the guys visualize that, and on both sides of it are doors, and behind those doors are the doubts. And as you're walking down that corridor, you want those doors closed. You want to confidently walk by each door saying, that's the door of conditioning. I'm good. And I'm good with my skill set. And I'm good with this. And I'm good with this. And I'm strength and conditioning. This. All of those things. You know, Because if you're not fully prepared and those doors start to open, then that can affect your performance, can affect a lot of things. And I think with, with a lot of athletes... You train, your, for example, you may have your, your A game. Yeah. Okay, this is my A game. So let's take, let's take a, a, an MMA fighter, for example. Say his A game is his wrestling, top wrestler. Yeah. And then he has, he's, he's got good hands and he's got good submission skills. And um, so what happens to a guy when his A game doesn't work, how he can move into his other games without being affected by it mentally. That's huge. Yeah. And so you have to prepare your guys for that. That you're going out there and rely on your strong point. And my strong point is not working tonight. What happens to that fighter then? Yeah. That's that's a huge moment right there. And they have to understand that that's okay. Yeah. Because we have B, C, and D, D here. Yeah. Right? That may be your top game, but these are all up to par. Absolutely. So let's just seamlessly work into these. Because A will come circle right back around again. And because your opponent is dealing with B, C, and D, he's not going to be able to handle A when it comes back at him again. Yeah. But if you keep trying to push A and push A and push A, and the more it doesn't work and the more he adjusts, that's when mentally you're, you're going to be – and then you're in the corner with your, your coach, and, it's, it's, and that's you're when it's tough in there. You're in trouble in there. Yeah, after just listening to that, I mean, to me, that's actually a good point to be able to kind of – talk to my listeners about is, you know, don't, you know, everything's a plan to be mentally stronger, mentally tougher. You have to have multiple plans in action. Um, in case one's not working, you can move on to the next one. Um, you always gotta, it seems like keep doing things and work harder to stay positive. Um, say, like you said, if that, if that's not working out today, you gotta move on to plan B. If that's not working out, it's time to move on to plan C. Uh, and find things that are going to work for you right. and keep you moving forward. Um, but if you just try to work on plan A and only focus on plan A all the time, and if it doesn't work for you, you don't know where to go from there. Right. Um, right. Especially with goal setting and setting yourself up for success. I mean, it, 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 you have to set yourself up for success multiple different ways. You can't just always worry about option A because if you only focus on option A and it goes to shit, you're in trouble. Right. Um, exactly. You don't know where to go. You start to scramble. You start to think negatively. Uh, so it's important to have, you know, once you have goals set, have different avenues to reach that goal uh, is where I'm kind of getting right, at, right. Um, you know, to get to your ultimate goal. Make yeah. sure you have different avenues set up. If one's not working, you know, move on to the next one, especially like nutrition plans. You know, there's not one. The thing I talk about people with nutrition is there's not one plan for everybody. Right. You may try one. That one didn't work for you, not because you weren't following it right. It just the foods or something weren't going, you know, doing, you know, for you what they should have been doing maybe your body reacted to it differently so you got to have a different option in there too to kind of keep working towards that other goal right you know don't get stressed out if a doesn't work but also don't like you said don't just beat your head against the wall try a try a try a try a because then you're just going to set yourself up for failure right and you're never going to be successful yeah. yeah um no i tell you what just hearing that for me was good for me to be able to use that to yeah. talk to clients yeah. um yeah. but now talk about because here's my favorite program since i met kent kent has been we've been working together now for over a year we started uh you know in my gym kent is now set up some of his programs other programs like fitness related programs uh boxing programs people you know programs for you know just your everyday average individual on top of running you know the kids heavy hitters youth wrestling program but you started a program that i think is better than Anything that I've seen so far out there, as far as what I know is out there, is the Parkinson's program. Right. Talk about that program and what that aim is and how that started um, and, and what the goal of that entire program is. Because literally you are changing people's lives. People who – what's 
what does just boxing in general do for Parkinson's patients? You know, we talked about it as a Parkinson patient program, but it also is an adaptive program. But the majority of the people are Parkinson's patients. Right, right. So talk about that program. Um, because I don't know, that's a new program, so people out there don't even really know about it yet. And I know once this program hits the air, I hope you are okay with me telling, yeah. talking about oh, the yeah, program. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, because I think once this hits the air, I think you're going to start to see an influx of members come in with the program. But talk about that program, because that's an unbelievable program. I mean, it, to me, what I've seen with those the, the members, the Parkinson's patients and members, and what we hear inside the other side of the gym of them screaming and yelling and having a blast. I mean, it literally makes my day on Tuesdays and Thursdays. All the members, you guys can't see us because there's a wall there. But, I mean, literally, we have members that kind of peek around the corner to see what's going on. And, you know, these are people who probably wouldn't have ever worked out again in their lives. No, uh, and no. now you're working with them and, and you're actually helping slow the process down, right, correct? Right. So that, talk about yeah, that program yeah, for me. Yeah. Well, that the the the. The box, boxing part of of the of um, the Parkinson's program started with a out in the Midwest with with the um, with program that they developed and they ended up franchising and now that's you can find that in a lot of different gyms now that <coughs> they have that it's called Rocksteady um, and I was approached by one of our one of our participants at the gym in New London to do that to do a program. And I said, geez, I'm, I'm not familiar with it, but I'll, let me take a look at it. So I, I did, and I got back to her, and um, I said, and, 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 and like most of the programs, you can, you can send your coaches out there, and you can get them certified, and then you can pay for the franchise. And, and, and I, it's a great program. I, some of the gyms, I know some of the gyms out of town that have it, and it, it, they're doing a great job on it. I kind of decided to go in the other direction with it. I, I, I don't, don't think I really need the franchise to do this. I, yeah. I've been doing this a long time, you know, and, and let me get some people that from the medical part of this thing. Um, so I had talked to my daughter, Jen, about it, and, and um, who's in the medical field, and, and uh, one of the guys that's, a, that's a, got a doctorate in physical therapy who works with Parkinson's patients and a, an athletic trainer, um, um, Brandon Muse, who's um, who was who had headed up a uh, neuromuscular disorder program for L and M. I talked to Dr. Alessi, who's a neurologist, about it, and he's a ringside physician. Matter of fact, he's going into the to the Boxing Hall of Fame in a couple of weeks oh, wow. for, as a ringside physician in his in his affiliation with boxing for years. But so got a good perspective on w really what we need to do, and um, and what can we do with this and. Um, and Parkinson's appears to be one of the few neuromuscular disorders, if not the only one, that medical science has most of the components in place knowing about it. Um, they don't have a cure, obviously, for it, but that's what they're working on, yeah. to do something from that medical end of it. Our job, in the meantime, is to keep the symptoms at bay as much as possible. What they found out with Park Par uh, Parkinson's is that so many, they're doing so many things simultaneously while they're thinking and they have to send signals. The muscles have to fire, the uh, nerves have to fire the muscles to, to step to the left and throw with the right hand, then duck, then come back up and throw another punch and then throw this punch. And the com figuring out the combinations and the movements and everything that goes with it is, is enormously beneficial for yeah. them, enormously beneficial. And they love it. And, um, and they're heroic. I, yeah. I, I, they're just amazing. To me, they just, you know, we, the, the program is called Championship Rounds. Yeah. And the reason I put that name on that is Championship Rounds, there, there, there are no more 15-round fights. Yeah. But for many years, they, they've been going for probably 20 years, but for many years, Championship Rounds were considered the 13th, 14th, and 15th round of a, of a title fight. Yeah. When you have warred for 12 rounds. Yeah. And you have three left, and these are the three most grueling rounds, which they found out were probably more of the injuries were attributed to that, so they dropped it back to 12. Yeah. So these people are in the championship rounds. You know, you, They're grinding you, you don't count on this. You, yeah. you work your entire life, and you're working towards your retirement, and you're going to retire and do some wonderful things, yeah, and now you have Parkinson's. And so these are the championship rounds. So you know what? Everybody has championship rounds. Absolutely. Right across the board. They're gonna and so the program is not just limited to that. We 
you know, have somebody coming in that had approached me, took the guy a lot of courage just to come through this door, enormously, severely depressed, doesn't like medication, first time off the couch in weeks, and came in and watched for a little while and said, this is for me. What, what do you think? And I said, you need to get in here. You already did the big part. Yeah. Got off the couch and, and you came here. Door, I said, yeah. "What?" I said, "What got you off the couch? Come in here." Nothing else did. Mm-hmm. So this—that's a good sign. So you need to get back here and do this. So, so now the program is kind of open up for, you know, you if you have, uh, you know, your arthritic condition or you have depression or whatever it is, whatever you're in the championship rounds of your life, whatever yeah. you consider them to be, come in here. It's more of a therapy type of come on in environment here and be together out. with everybody. Yeah. And we'll work out. We'll have some fun. We play some good old music. And that's, and, you know yeah. what, believe it or not, I mean, that environment alone is kind of the whole CrossFit environment too. Um, you know, people become more successful with their own fitness and health and nutrition because they're in a group setting. Right. And it's, it's a reason to want to come to the gym. Right. Where right. back in the old day, even when I started uh, yeah. training and working, I mean, you had, you owned a gym too with all Nautilus equipment. And right. I mean, they would just come in. The people who were just self-motivated at the time came in, grinded it out, and did it. Right. Because they were self-motivated. Yeah. You never saw people in there who weren't self-motivated because it just wasn't enough for them. It wasn't enough. Yeah. I think that's what made CrossFit so successful so fast. People ask, how did this happen so quickly? I mean, you think about it. I've owned this gym now for eight, nine years. Um, it was kind of still in the beginning stages of CrossFit when they started out in California. Um, not many people knew about it. And then you look at it three years later. Right. And it is like literally there's a gym in every single town. Sometimes there's two gyms in, in, in a town. Right. But I think the reason was was because of the environment that was created and nothing else. I mean, the program's great. The results were awesome. But I think any program is great and awesome if you just show up and listen. Right. Um, and I think that the community is what got people to show up and yeah. listen. Yeah. So I think that's why I see this Parkinson program and the the program in general. Uh, what what what's it? championship uh, championship rounds, rounds is going to be yeah. tremendously successive. I use tremendous. Yeah. I don't think I was ever going to be able to use that word. Great word. That's, if you know anything about the word, great you're... word, tremendous. Uh, Kent yeah, uses yeah. it at least twenty times per conversation with me outside. Yeah. Um, I finally got to use it, but it is. It's it's going to have tremendous yeah. success. Um, well, we did we did along those lines. Now I I, I started this other program called, um, and it's actually Shannon Brennick. You know Shannon. Yeah. Shannon has Gray Dog Designs her 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 uh, company, so it's kind of spot. We I mean, it's called the Whaling City Grays. Yeah. Now these are guys sixty five and older, for boxing boxing drills. That's what they do. That's not contact unless they want to do some light sparring, but that's that's not required. And it's hit, getting together yeah. and hitting the bags and everything. And if you're under 65, you can be in you could be 55 and up to 65, but you have to have a permission slip to be as a younger person yeah. to be allowed to be in here because <laughs> you, you're kind of young. Maybe your attention span isn't good, whatever the case is. But we will allow younger people 55 and older That's to awesome. come into it yeah. 65 you automatically can come in yeah. so we have some great guys in this thing that's um, awesome yeah is that in uh new london that's in new london that's awesome yeah, yeah that's, i see i actually what time like, that's on saturday is that, it? no that's on that's like monday wednesday friday mornings that's right because i see at, some of them going o'clock. you know yeah. why because yeah. i have a client that i'm done with her at her house at eight o'clock yeah and they're going and they're in. going in yeah. and i did yeah. she's right across the street it's, from it's you great. guys and it's the camaraderie the guys they get together they come in and you know and they're and you know what, it's a funny thing when it, well, like we're talking about fitness and 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 a guy will go you know well i'm like my shoulder, my shoulder's bothering me a little bit, my hip, my knee, you know, and I said, listen, you don't, let you, do you have to pay attention to that? Yes. But the first time you feel a little something in your shoulder is just the first sign that it's bothering you, yeah. all right? Still work. Yeah. Don't push it too hard, but don't back off that. You'll back off this, you'll back off this, you'll back off that, and you'll stop. Yeah. And don't don't stop. It's the good pain. Yeah. It's the good pain. Check with your doctor. You know, tell them that what you're doing for exercise that you're doing, and then you modify. If you can't do overhead, you lean back a little bit and do it this way. There's ways to modify what you're doing. You need to stay busy. Yeah, and th- you need to stay busy. You know, and I guess that maybe that's another a point that you we, we kind of got to get out there too is. 
I, I love that that you just said that because everyone's always every time they feel an injury they have to stop they have to take a break they can't do this you know they come to us all the time they don't realize you can modify anything if you I tell people if you get up and out of a chair every day you can work out whether you have an yeah. injury or not we could still work with you right. unless you were immobile stuck in a full body cast in a, in the hospital somewhere. You could still work out. You could right. do something active. Right. So it's important because the longer you delay it, the longer you take time off, you're just not going to come in anymore, and then you're really screwed. You're screwed then, um, yes. So guys, listen yep. to that. I mean, get just show up. And if you have a good trainer, you have a good coach, they'll modify it for you. So make sure that you tell them that you have an injury, yes, but we're never going to say, oh, you can't do something. So don't even look for that excuse for us to be like, okay, it's okay to go home. That's like not even acceptable to us as trainers and coaches because we want to make sure that you can still do something and we'll be able to get you to still do right, something. Right, But, I mean, that's awesome. Talk about Heavy Hitters Company. And what, what the stri- what what the goal behind this company is? The goal behind the beverage company was to um, be able to sell the juice and make some money, to be able to bring money in for the program. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of really great nonprofits out there, and everybody's looking for a little something to keep their program going. New London's got some great programs. Yeah. And everybody needs, you know, you, you, you apply for this grant and apply for that grant, and it's a kind of an arduous task of getting. You know, I went to a grant writer's uh, little seminar up at Conn College, and they had these representatives from different grant groups up there and, and had all these little organizations in the room. And when you get, somebody tries to fill out the 23 pages yeah, that are crazy. necessary for it, and then the answer comes back that you got rejected, you know, you didn't, you know, and, and, and I, I, when I met with them after the class, I said, how many of these places do you go and visit? Do you go see? Yeah. You know, and get your finger on the pulse of the person you're rejecting. I mean, there could be a guy that's down the street that's got a little thing in his house that he teaches music. He needs more instruments. He needs some support. Reject. But you need you need to meet him. Yeah. Somebody, you need to get together collectively and hire one guy who's got something on the ball to go and, and get his finger on the pulse of the program. He might have four or five kids. Well, that's four or five kids not out on the street that are doing something that they love to do. And guys like Winston Marsalis and these different musicians over the years came from those programs. Yeah. And he can't sustain it. And he can't write a grant. Yeah. He's not he going to write 23 pages. No. He doesn't, he can't. And all the demographics and this and that and, and, the, and, the, and the area of the size of the city and the... It's he, crazy. I mean, Ken, I tried he, he to write, can't do it. I tried to do a nonprofit, yeah. and yeah. I rather just paid. I rather just pay my taxes. Yeah, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because it's. I rather take some of the money out of the gym because it's crazy that I can't run a program for underprivileged kids because it takes like an astronomical amount of work and education that I don't even have yeah. to write a grant. Yeah, um, yeah they're they're di- they're difficult. Uh, so yeah. you know, I think it needs to be kind of structured they give out money all over the place to think reasons why who knows why they even give money out to but when there's programs out there actually trying to help kids yeah. um which should be the major thing that's going on in this country right now is trying to develop i mean there are people that are just lost causes in different generations but yeah. kids are not lost causes and i think that more needs to go into programs to help with these kids uh to get them to be, you know, have a future instead of just going to the dumps and, and kind of continuing on where maybe their parents are or, or whatever yeah. the reason is. I mean, if they're underprivileged, they're underprivileged for a reason. Yeah. Um, we're not trying to just give money out to rich kids to come in and work out for free. No. We literally are trying to get to kids that have nothing uh, to try to help them and be some sort of a, a mentor guidance to better them so that they can improve society because after even today i mean what we saw today guys we we, this comes out on friday but this is monday right now and we just saw the mass shooting in in uh in vegas i mean society's it's out of control it's i think it's a responsibility to everybody to try to improve the younger generation any way that you can i mean if that's something i can get out there is work with kids don't just turn kids away don't turn your back on young kids where if you see kids that need help and you have the power to do that step in and try to help them because it could improve our society greatly yeah um well, that's 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 a whole i mean that topic is is that's yeah. a huge topic right now I, I i had some people at the gym a couple of weeks ago um just came up to see what we're doing for programs up there um and we were talking about the kids and they happened to come up on a night where the youth wrestling was going on, and I had maybe 
maybe four or five kids in there that were under under 12 years old, under 11, 12 years old. And they were looking specifically for young kids to be in the gym. And I had probably 18 or 20 kids in there that were from 18 to 26 years old. And they said, well, where's all the, the kids? I said, well, you keep, I said, the kids, the nine, 10, 11 years old. I said, well, they were up wrestling. Like, you go up and see that. I said, but let me, let me point something out to you. Why one of the reasons we're in, I, I, in my, my estimation, why we're in the kind of some of the trouble that we're in right now is that that group that's over there, those, those kids, that, those are the forgotten ones. See, the 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old, do they need help? Absolutely. When they, but a lot of people in their lives, a lot of teachers, administrators from schools, aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers, a lot of stuff. Yeah. 19, 20, 21, 22, out of high school, on their own. That, that great optimism that I told you before starts to wane. They're looking for other ways to make money. Their hope starts to diminish a little bit. And nobody is there. Yeah. They're on their own with no strategy. That group is the one. Some of those kids are the ones that are you finding out now that are you in your epidemic of overdosing right yeah. now. And my daughter's a emergency room nurse. Why you'll have somebody that that overdoses and then and, and repeats. Yeah. And and that's but that particular group right there. Uh, to me, is is the is like the endangered species. You got to, they they need a lot of attention. They need a lot of work, um, and you know they're like the forgotten ones. Yeah. You know they all of a sudden they're out of school, and it's okay. Let's let's you know we'll school, work with the younger kids that are coming the, up through, and then we'll just pass them on. And, yeah, and it's and it's difficult, and it's not an easy. There's no easy solution to this. I know that. I mean, it's not like and there's, there's certainly no finger pointing at anybody. I think everybody is doing their jobs here, trying to do what they can. It's a difficult situation. Um, I, I had a I had a discussion with um, with um, the people that run one of the programs. Um, it's called Community Speaks Out, which is a fantastic, fantastic group. Um, they and they deal with these issues of of drug dependency and and um, and they deal they help the families out and um, and I'm not gonna I can't give them the possible justice that they need right now. I don't know every aspect of it, but I know. That's mostly what they do, and they do a fantastic job. They're have, having great success with the program. Um, and we were discussing this, and, and part of the reason why we're in the trouble we're in now is we are so far behind, and, 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 and I, I, always has, I have felt this for years, but it was kind of substantiated by this, this doctor who spoke up at Conn College that in terms of mental health, we don't treat mental health like physical health. Yeah. It's it's still in the dark ages, and by this time, we we you know when a kid goes for physical, he, he should be able to you know you do his EKG and he does his blood work and he does this and then the you know, well how you feeling I feel good, um, anxiety now I'm all right, you, you're depressed no I'm good, cause he doesn't want the tag yeah, and he should be allowed yeah so you it, it and and if we don't and so they're gonna self medicate, they they don't want anybody to know. All right, and they'll say that they found out I had a hot murmur, or I had this. That's okay. Yeah. They, oh, good. The doctor found it, and you're going to be okay with this. They need to be allowed to say, to say the doctor said I was depressed. Yeah. Oh, good. Now we can we can do what we have to do here to understand you more. But no, they're not. They're not. They can't do that. Yeah. And we're still in the dark ages on that. And and until that day comes that that is treated like the that is treated like the EKG. We're going to be in trouble because they have access to stuff on the streets and still nobody knows that they don't have the tag around all those tags. We, we're a big, big tag hanging society today. We got the, yeah, the, we the, label the everybody. oh, we got everything on it. We got to put this one on over here. You're, 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 you're um, ADD and you're this and you're that and you're blah, 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 blah. Here, put this one on too. Put the, you got all your tags and you're walking down the hallway in school basically with your tags on yeah. and you become the tag. The tag is the reason why I can't do this. Yeah, you know, oh yeah, and it's and, and it's it's unfortunate, and I'm I hate to be the guy that points those things out and doesn't have a solution, I, I, and I don't like that. I, I wish I had a solution to it, and I point it out merely because we obviously we ha we all have to come together to try to find some way to do this, and not point fingers and oh, yeah. you're not doing your job or you're not no, everybody is trying and it's frustrating, 
but it and it but it requires us all to find some pathway to be able to do this and until we can do that with these kids those 19 20 21 22 year olds you know we're in trouble it's, we're in trouble we're in they're trouble. in trouble yeah so that's a big topic. I didn't mean to ramble on about it. No. But that's one of my... I, I'm kind of been moving more and more and more in that direction now. The, 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 the Starting with the Parkinson's program started me thinking about, ah, you know, I got to start looking at... And now, and now I'm looking... Uh, and I'm going to try to align our program up with some of these other programs yeah. right now. Yeah, that's what these podcasts are for. Yeah, and it's all about mental toughness and mental strength. But getting a message out to people especially in our community, like the whole reason behind this podcast was to get messages out to our community. Yeah. You know, I can only help so many people who walk through my gym. I think I said this on the first or second podcast, but I, on something like this, on social media, this will spread on social media on our community and someone could learn from it and, and it could change somebody. And if I change one person every single podcast, I'm doing a pretty good job at helping people. Right. And again, it's all about trying to reach out to the community and our com- I'm going to live here probably for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Maybe when I retire, and yeah, if that'll never happen because I, I like to work too much. Yeah, but yeah, that won't happen. You, you're never retiring. I'm never. Yeah. No. But the thing with me is, this is my community, and I want to see a better community. And whether it's a healthier community, uh, a safer community, it's all about that. So the goal behind this is, I want people, and that's why most of the people that I have on this podcast are from this area, because these are the people that can help and people can relate to. Um, so again, I, I, I'm pumped. I'm privileged to have you on the show, but. Because I said you were the most interesting man alive, you have to tell me and our listeners, did you really climb up a flagpole upside down for a grinder? You've no, got to tell no, the story. No. we got to end on no. that because you yeah, are, yeah. you've done things. No, I've no. heard stories. I need to know. No, 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 no. I'm going to tell you, <coughs> I'm going to tell you the truth on that. No. No. I, I, I have done many different things on the, on the different challenges like that. <laughs> And, 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 and did well at a lot of them. Did well at a lot of them. That one there happened uh, many, many years ago in the middle of Niantic. Uh, decided that I could climb the flagpole on the green in Niantic upside down. And the, the bets came in the bar. We were in a, sitting in a little, <laughs> a little tavern at the time, sipping a cold beer. Sipping. And the bets came, and we headed down. And my partner at the time that I was working with, I kicked up onto the flagpole, got a hold of the pole upside down, and the pole is a lot, lot larger on the bottom. Then it gets smaller. I started up, and I got up probably maybe two and a half feet, three feet, and I slid back down to the to the ground with my head on the ground, and I'm still holding onto the pole. And he bent down, and he said quietly. Are you doing this to try to get more money out of them? That you, I said I can't do this, <laughs> and I didn't. So that I you, did, I did not climb it for a grinder. Oh my God! No, I thought no, you did it. no. The absolute truth was uh, I never made it up. I was waiting no, for it. No, I've made it up many at a pole, right? Regular way, without using legs, just Your regular arm. way. Yeah, but I never. I tried that. And the truth is, I failed miserably. Oh. No, I failed miserably at it. Uh, you're still the most interesting I man know. alive. That's been, one story and, out of no, a I million. Wish I, I, I wish I could say I did that one. <laughs> I, I, just, I, I thought I could too, but oh. no. no. Uh, no. So you heard it first. I, that's a, <laughs> if you're listening and you thought you've heard that story multiple times, like yeah. I have, yeah. that yeah. didn't happen. But that, you did walk down Bank Street on your hands. I oh, I did that for yeah. food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and from the and from the Danny's Cafe to the Morton House. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man! And a couple other things. Yeah. Like, but. like I did say, he is the most interesting man alive, and one of the most fit guys. And the first thing I, when I met Ken, he told me that nobody should be able to fight if they can't power curl ninety pound dumbbells. And he came in and grabbed the dumbbells and started power curling them for reps. Right. That's it. That's <laughs> so, right. Guys, thank you for checking in this week with our uh, the Mind Gym. Thank you for listening. Hopefully, you've learned something, what Kent had to say. Guys, check out his beverage company, Heavy Hitters. The the majority of the proceeds go to Heavy Hitters um, USA, which is helping underprivileged kids, you know, get into the gym, get off the streets, work with some of these coaches, and have a better opportunity at life down the road. So, thanks for checking in. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you. (laughs) 